Hey, strangers. Welcome to the dumpster fire that is the strange <laughs> sessions today. Oh my God. It has been nonstop issues since we got down here today. I mean, uh, we're lucky we're even recording. We are. So, point. Krista, if you would like to fill them in on some of our shenanigans we've had to deal with. Oh, my gosh. Well, first of all, we get down here and the table's covered in ants. <laughs> <laughs> so many ants. So grossed out. So I had to call in Jim to the rescue because uh, he took care of ants we had in our kitchen a few weeks ago. But it's that time of year. I mean, ants are just going to make their way in. So Jim did some spraying. We did some cleaning. We needed to clean up anyway. This <laughs> we place did. needed a little spruce. We did. It was spring cleaning. There is nary an ant in sight now, so I feel good about that. Um, then we started doing test audio, and it doesn't sound right. <laughs> so. Yeah, because we don't know if when Krista lifted up the, the board, the, mixer, the yeah. mixer to get underneath it, if she accidentally hit something. So we feel like her volume isn't as good as it usually is. So if it's not this episode, forgive Sorry. us. Sorry. <laughs> Again, we're not professionals. After I told you the other day, people are giving us money, so we should actually like oh deliver a, yeah. a, a an actual professional podcast. I should read a book <laughs> no, on like how to record. I actually have two <laughs> dummies books for dummies uh, podcasting oh, in advance. Yeah, they're on my nice. they're on my iPad. Okay. We should probably should probably read those probably sometime read them, to get some yeah. tips about how to do a podcast. Ugh, any hoozles. <laughs> I have a headache too. Yeah, Chris has got a headache, so we are not batting a thousand today so far. <laughs> batting like a four. I'm okay. My, well, good. I'm glad uh, you're okay. Want to give shout outs to our newest strangers, and those are Dan Gomez, Leonel Gines, Elizabeth Doe, Anna McEwen, Jessica Hinton, and Allie Quirk. I would just like to say that Elizabeth Doe picked that name in honor of my. I was wondering name. about that. I used to be Krista, Krista Doe. Doe. Now I'm yeah. Krista Strange, but I thought that so. Was no, sweet. these are all. Thank you guys so much for joining. Like Allie has written about how much we've helped her. So yeah. that's just awesome. So we've Allie, a few of everybody, those thank you guys so much for joining the group. Oh yeah, and quickly, if we forgot already, if you don't want to sit through the titillating twenty. <laughs> Check your show notes. Kurt is going to post when the actual topic starts. So if yep. you don't want to listen to taste tests and all the housekeeping, just press pause, check your show notes, and fast forward to when the topic starts. Yes. Uh, housekeeping stuff. So uh, much. Work, my work, my schooling is is done for You're the year. officially on summer and, break. Uh, as the listeners that are actual friends with me on my Facebook know, that last day was hard. Mm-hmm. Like, like uh, one of the girls that I was... She was one of my students at lunch, came up to me at the end of the day, just sobbing oh, and hugged me. And it's really? like, oh, yeah. You so, you put this post on Facebook that had me in tears. It was just, it so. was rough. I cried so many times that day. You know, like yeah. there, there were students that wouldn't give you the time of day at the beginning of the year. And on the last day of school, they were hugging me, telling me I was their favorite teacher Aww. and stuff. And it was just, yeah. So I made the right decision to go back. I, I agree. And, but we're just worried about that meltdown I had that that, <laughs> that time. So hopefully that doesn't happen again. Uh, I've We're doing the diet stuff. So yep. Yeah. We, so if you haven't heard, if you're not on Facebook, we started um, because we... Tur- <laughs> Turk? <laughs> wow. Turk. You know, every time I try to take you in a photo, I must hit L and I put lurk instead. <laughs> I don't know why I find that so funny. Anyway, after last episode where Kurt said he wanted to lose weight, strangers were like, hey, we should start a group. So we do have a strangers shape up group now. It's a private group on Facebook. If you want to join, people are just sharing tips and motivation and kind of what their goals are. So that's a little background on that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, er, this week was tough because it was the first week I was really dieting and I was yeah. hungry and just crabby all the time. And at this point, it's actually getting a little bit better. Good. I actually feel like just a smidge better. I don't know if it's just my mind thinking that, but I'm doing okay. Good. So you guys are awesome. Thank you so much yeah. for the motivation and all the tips and everything. Totally. It's yeah. great. And I worked out every day this week, so I'm feeling pretty good I didn't good necessarily about work out. I'm just watching what you I eat. You can get to that. I wanted to get out for a walk a couple of days, but it was hot. And, oh, it was so hot. Yeah. It, you, You don't want to dive in. You want to take baby steps. It's either too hot or too cold. There's like one day in October where I can get out for walks and I'm happy. (laughs) It's supposed to be really nice next week, like 70s. Yeah. Yep. And we also have a really cool group podcast coming out. Uh, Brad from... from, Killing Hidden Missing. Yes. He he put together this, this group project where... 
um, I like I think there's us? seven yeah. seven podcasts, and we each do a twenty minute segment. And he's calling he's, it a pod festival. A pod festival, and he's yeah. he's stitching it all together. And we will release it July second, mm-hmm. I believe. Yep. But it's cool. It's like a neat way. The, we're doing the story on, on David Glenn Lewis, which we've already covered. Yeah. But it's a good way to listen to little smidges. It's the second time I use the word smidge today. Just a smidge. Just a smidge. It's <laughs> <laughs> to listen to other podcasts to see if you vibe with them yeah. or not. And it's a little extra exposure for us. So yeah. So it, it's super cool. And that will be out to July second. I will drop that into our podcast feed. Cool. And Krista, if you want to talk about the give us coffee thing, which just floored us yesterday. So we keep talking about how we're going to do a Patreon, but um, Tristan reached out and said, hey, there's another way to go because Patreon actually takes part of your money. Like they collect a percentage of everything you make. And he said that he uses this website called, it's called ko-fi.com. It's ko-fi.com. And uh, they don't take any of your money. So whatever people contribute to you, you keep 100%. And you, there's even like a free level, which we started at. That's just how I signed us up. But then I bumped us up to the gold. It's like 55 bucks for the entire year. That's not bad. And then people can do a monthly subscription if they want. And it's whatever you feel like donating. And so we set this up, or I set it up yesterday, thinking, okay, we'll, we'll get some content on there eventually. I just wanted to get the ball rolling. We already had, I don't know, maybe 10 people yeah. donate. And some of these donations were way more than I would ever expect yes. anyone Thank to donate. You. Seriously, and from even the, the bottom people of our who, hearts. Yeah, Thank you. Even the $3 donations are still so meaningful to us because I just wasn't expecting anyone to do anything. So Yeah, and, and wow. as soon as you got that up and going, I was laying on my couch and all of a sudden I'm getting all these notifications totally. that someone, someone bought you coffee, someone bought you coffee. Yeah. From the moment I set it up till we went to bed last night, it seemed like we were getting notifications. Yes. So, wow. Yeah. So we're blown seriously, away. Seriously, thank you. This is the stuff that's going to go towards uh, getting our server space issue figured out because I've had so many people yep. contact me and ask why like the first five or six episodes are missing. Yeah. And I guess that's a good heads up too. I actually want to migrate us to a totally different platform because we're still attached to sort of old school media stuff. The server is owned by Joe's brother and I think Joe's still paying for our website and I just want to I want everything to be 100% us us. and funded by our our listeners yes and also I want complete control right now I have no control over this problem we're having and and so I just would really like to to have everything within our control and we're paying for everything etc so actually yes these funds that we're getting are going to help us get that set up exactly and I'm so not techie so I've reached out and asked for anybody who's techie at all to help because i don't know how to migrate our entire website to another platform and not interrupt yeah you know anyone's listening experience yeah and i don't so. know how that's going to work if that's going to get rid of our old episodes i on don't feeds, think so, so what i was reading is that you can migrate your rss feed from one site to uh, another okay so <laughs> well, i hope that's true <laughs> we'll, we'll find out all of a sudden yeah, all our we'll stuff is out. gone worse comes to worse i mean uh i know that tiff has all of our stuff on the internet archive yeah. I, I have all of the MP3s of every episode we've done. So for some reason, anybody like like I'm not up to date with tech like in my car and stuff. Mm. So if there's a podcast I want to listen to, I have to download it on my computer as an MP3, put it on a flash drive and then listen to it in my car on the flash That's drive. Funny. Yeah. So if anybody does want like our entire catalog as an MP3 that, you know, I can put it on a flash drive as all MP3s. And put it in a Dropbox or something, or just send it to them as, oh, a, as send a flash go. drive to yeah. them, and they'll, they'll have a flash drive with all of our episodes on it. Yeah. So we're Sweet. we're trying to figure out what we're gonna do. Yeah, we're in a transitionary period. Yes, in a good way. Yes. Uh, what else? Um, oh, just I want I want to thank Brian and Lauren again for having me on their yeah. transatlantic history ramblings. Very Neil, cool. like Neil Story, I love him. He is just he is so cool, and I love. When it's us on on their podcast, we did a. It was about the differences between ghost hunting in in Britain and ghost hunting in the United States. Oh, but gotcha. you know how his podcast goes; it was all over the place <laughs> yep. in a good way. Did you talk about wings at all? Oh, we talked about wings. Yeah, <laughs> it was in, in a good way. It was it was <laughs> yeah. it was all over the place. In a, like our episode we did with Joe, where we <laughs> were all over the place. You know, oh, so yeah, 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 yeah. So it was in a good way. So just thanks again, guys, for having me on. Um, do we have anything else? 
Probably. Should we <laughs> should we jump into opening? We have two packages we're going to yeah. open. We also had one sent to us by Adam and Sophie. Thank you, Adam and Sophie. But I know that's a taste test item. And so we have we, some taste tests we need to get Yeah, so first. we might save their taste test item so till next this? week. Oh, this is or Josh. Or two weeks from now. Josh and Whit- Whitney. Josh and Whitney. And, Carpenter. Yep. So we can open that one. All right. I already have the ceremonial dagger at my dispense, so... No, Krista talking off in the distance where nobody can hear her. <laughs> As she pushes her microphone away. <laughs> Ooh, did you see that? Oh, I see a note. Okay. I, I'll wait till you're done reading. Okay, ready? I'm ready. Dear K and K. That's Aww, us. <laughs> K, K squared. We had a few more things to send you from our trip. Everything comes from the Little Ailey Inn in Rachel, Nevada. So jealous because I, I want to go there so badly. So it's like a hotel? No, it's like a, 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 f- a little bar that's near Area 51. Oh, it's that's, out in the middle of nowhere, yes, right? Okay. Yeah. We figured the strange seller needed some of these artifacts and memorabilia. Stay strange, Josh and Whitney. P.S. Don't worry, nothing edible. <laughs> Thank you so much, I mean, you guys. you know us. We'd try it. Ooh, okay. Ooh, I want to put that on my whiteboard. So. It's from the Dunder Mifflin note. I love the Dunder Mifflin notepad. Fragile. It's fragile. fragile. It must be Italian. Oh, is this like a menu? Okay, you open that first. We'll do one at a time. <laughs> this is so cool. Area area fifty one. Area, area fifty one ground specimen. Come on, really? <laughs> it's so cool. It's so teeny tiny and adorable. And it's gonna be perfect by our stuff in our little hutch. Heck yeah. That is awesome. It's our own little sample of Area 51 dirt. That's so cute. I like anything in miniature. This is so cool. Okay. This looks like... I'm going to take a picture. Location. I think this it's is from the menu. East Access Gate Ooh, of wow. Groom Lake. Yeah. So, I mean, this is actually from there. That's so cool. That is really cool. Okay. Here, you want me to take that? Okay. This is a, looks it looks like, like a, menu. a menu. Oh, I'm so jealous. World famous alien burger. Served with lettuce, tomato, pickle, and our alien sauce. Only $7.75. Oh, they got they have breakfast, sandwiches, beverages. Look at how cute this is. I am so jealous because I just want to go there so bad. Because I love I've seen diner it, food, I, But too. I've seen it in so many uh, like Posts. UFO shows. Yeah. They always have somebody at the little alien. Oh, I love this. I mean, I feel like, um, oh my I God. Tr- I want to try the alien burger. Josh Gates had to have been there at some yes. point, right? Yes. Okay. That is so cool. I don't know how I'm going to take a we need, of that. We need I'm another whiteboard. Try. We need to put that on another whiteboard. We do. How, how do we already need another whiteboard? That's I don't know. Crazy. That is awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. We've got a business card and a sticker. That is awesome. Going on the whiteboard. Uh, I mentioned Earthlings I'm, welcome. <laughs> if I mention I'm jealous because I want to go to this place <laughs> so badly. I think you've mentioned it. Guide map of Area 51, Groom Lake. Ooh. I'll take pictures this of all so this. This is so cool. It is awesome. Ooh, Area 51, an S4 handbook. Look at this. Is there like a signature on there? What is that all about? Chuck Clark. He must have put this together. Wow, it's like an actual... That's crazy. Like book of what's... Deceptive natural. This is really cool. I want to take a picture of that. Thank you so wow. much, you guys. Yeah, this is so cool. This is so great for the the studio. Now I feel like we're Mulder and Scully because we have this stuff. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes, thank you so much, you guys. Well, I don't think this is gonna make it up on the whiteboard. It's a little too heavy. We'll have to find. No, put that in the in the hutch. It. Okay. I'll I actually wanted to bring that home and read that, so I might take that yeah, home and look at you that. Should. Okay, I'm going to put all this back in here. That is awesome. Thank you so yeah, thank much, you guys. You guys. Seriously. Ugh. Okay. I and this one is from Jennifer. I don't know if... I never know if they want their last names said. Oh, right. But this is from... Je- Oop. I bash myself in the face on my microphone. This is from... Even though we cleaned our table off, there's no room in here. Yeah. So. We're, we're okay. hopeless. <laughs> we sincerely do need that intern. Okay. Ugh. I said, I, clearly I need someone to come here and clean. <laughs> All we can think of is that Krista spilled something sweet from a taste test right by where she sits because that was like Aunt Central. Well, we haven't had a beverage in a while, so I think it was just crumbs. <laughs> you, almost, you, know? you almost cut your hand just now you know. opening the... Sacrifice my body for the show. Yeah, if you cut yourself with a ceremonial dagger, I wonder if you're going to like summon some kind of demon. <laughs> 
I mean, it's possible. Oh, come on. And people want video of this? People want us to do a live show. Oh. It'll be like a live show of nothing but Krista <laughs> opening packages. <laughs> <laughs> well, here, there's a really cute uh, oh, postcard. postcard. I can read that while you struggle with that. Thanks. <laughs> Kurt and Krista, love the show. You do an amazing job, and your strange quote unquote family are so grateful to have you both. Aww. Aww. We, we had all said it time and time again, but we do truly love you and this family. Hope you enjoy the taste test inside in moderation, right? Oh boy, uh -oh. <laughs> I think this is going to be a, a booze. <laughs> Stay strange and quote unquote keep exercising. Love it, Jennifer. Jennifer, thank you so yeah. much. Oh my God, I'm really struggling. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and people want unedited versions of our Dang. of our it's a podcast. Half hour of me trying to open this box. <laughs> <laughs> oh, making myself nervous. Okay. In moderation. Whew. All right, you want to oh. open that? Oh, there's like I don't know what's what. Okay, hold on. Let's take a peek. Ooh. There's a big bag of something in I've here. I've seen these in the grocery store. Okay. Should we do that and save this for next time? There's we, another taste test in here. We, these are just candies, so we could do both. Okay. Let's wait. On, I'll open it when we're ready. These are Ooh. high chews. High chews. Fruit I, combos. I want to say coated with chia seeds. Ooh, I want to I want like to say these are Japanese because I always see these like in the Japanese food section. High chew. High chew. Gesundheit. <laughs> I set the things on the keyboard. That's why it happened. Okay. Yeah, we ex uh, Krista accidentally stopped recording. Struggle bus. Yeah, today is not a good day for the strain sessions. Driver of the struggle bus today. Okay, hold on. I, I want to try these. We'll get to that. <gasps> mm -hmm. Curting me for the taste test. Okay. Um, let's see. We'll take one of each. Yeah. 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 Oh, two yeah. or three. Give me two or three. Couple two three. Okay. This is the. Immensely fruity, intensely chewy. Dragon fruit, acia kiwi, coated with chia seeds. So should we try this and then open the other one? Yes. Okay. Do they have different flavors? This is dragon fruit. This is acia. I think that's how you say that. I have. Oh. Oh. It's mm. really good. Mm -hmm. And there are chia Ooh. seeds. Mm hmm It's like a, the inside is squishy. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not a very appetizing way to describe it, but mm. it's really good. Mm hmm. Hmm. I really like that. Hmm. Oh my gosh, the kiwi one was really good. Mm. That's what you tried was mm -hmm. kiwi. Hmm. Hmm. I just got a chia seed. I like chia seeds. Okay, now which one are you trying? A case, a sai. How you pronounce a, it? A, a case. Maybe I the, always call I it a case. So do I. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm doing too. Mm, I like that one better. That is really good. Mm -hmm. mm. I just got a chia seed too. Those are really good. Note to self don't leave all these wrappers down here. No. Okay, I'm only trying one more. Okay. You want two? One. Pina colada. Ooh, I'm going to try the pina colada. And tr then I'll try the tropical smoothie if I can find it. Okay. I still have the super chewy. one. Ooh, pina colada one smells good. Okay, ready? Yep. Ooh, these are way chewier. Like, harder. Mm. It's a workout. <laughs> <laughs> I like the other ones better because they're softer. I feel like I'm burning calories chewing this. Mm -hmm. mm, pina colada is good. I like the... I'm not a big fan of pina colada, so I'm glad I like I pina coladas. Them. Getting caught in the rain. <laughs> Making love at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> tropical smoothie. I like the tropical smoothie. It's passion fruit and mango. And obviously yours is coconut and pineapple. Mm. Mm. That is tasty. Yeah. Mm. Okay, you want to throw Yes. Okay. I'm going to throw those in a bag so we don't have any more ants down here. Oh, everybody just probably cringed when I said bag because apparently we say bag. Grocery bag. bag. Grocery bag. What are you, how are you supposed to say bag? Bog. Bag. 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 <laughs> but we say bag. Bag. Okay. I'm a big fan of Molly Yeh. She's a, um, a chef on Food Network and she's from the Midwest and she pronounces salad salad Ooh. <laughs> she's from oh. Chicago okay ready mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that pina colada one 
Oh, I wanted to try these. Aaron told me that these were really good, and I've never got to try these. Oh, my goodness. So these are hers, which we've tried a lot of their stuff. Yeah, potato chips. But I think they're like cheesy poofs. Cheesy, they are cheesy poofs. But they're grilled cheese and tomato soup yes. flavor. <laughs> yes. Aaron told me that these are amazing. The fact that anyone came up with this just is amazing. Hold on. Oh, I'm excited. Me too. I still have fruit stuck in my teeth, though. Yep. They smell like a stinky shoe. That doesn't bode well for <laughs> Maybe the... it's Gouda cheese. <laughs> that doesn't bode well for the taste. Okay, are you ready? I'm ready. Mmm. That's actually really good. I can totally... Like, the first taste I get is tomato soup, and then that goes away, and then it's a grilled cheese sandwich. Mm, I'm not picking up all those flavors. I'm totally picking up the tomato soup. Right in between the first taste, and the, it starts grilled cheese, and then it goes to tomato soup, and then it goes to back to grilled cheese. Mm. I totally get that in both of the ones I tried. I love I'm only these. picking up on a little bit of grilled cheese. Like, it's obviously, mm. they're very cheesy. I love these. Hmm. You can take them home. I will. That'll be my splurge. Hmm. If I didn't know these had a special flavor, though, I would just assume these were cheese flavored. Hmm. Mm. I do that a lot. Oh, we didn't mm. give the candy out of 10. Oh, mm. I'm going to give the candy an 8. I'm going to give it a 9. Ooh, that's really strong. The cheese flavor? What are you going to give these out of 10? <sighs> I'm going to give them a 7 because I don't really, I'm not picking up on all those flavors. I'm going to give them a nine or a nine and a half. I love the way they're seasoned. They're, they're like stronger. satisfyingly crunchy. Yeah, and they're stronger cheese flavored mm -hmm. than like your typical cheesy poof. Mm. So again, if Krista's sound isn't as good in this episode, we apologize because she's worried about... I am. I'm, I'm worried. It just seems quieter. The more I eat these, the more I'm giving them a 10. I bump mine up <laughs> to a 10 because these are amazingly good. They're like seasoned perfectly. I I am a fan of like cheesy poofs. Mm. I don't eat them often, but or, it's like a real treat. I gotta put those away. Oh dear God, those were good. Okay, what are we forgetting anything before we move on? We're at uh, we have an minutes. email I want to read at the end. Okay. All right, are we ready to jump? I think we are. I think we're going to read an email at the end of the episode, but okay. I think we are ready to jump into the main topic. Cool. I'm just going to take some candids as we go. Okay. All right. On to our main story. This should make everybody very happy. It should. Uh, what, you know, and there's a couple things about this that we talked about not doing a specific missing 411 episode anymore because we've kind of done those to death. So what we decided we were going to do is that we were going to do a My Favorite Mini Missing 411 episode where Krista and I would each do a story. Mm -hmm. And we picked our stories, and I realized that my story was a little lengthy, and we decided that we're going to just do these as Missing 411 spotlights, where we're going to do one disappearance an episode. Okay. Because I feel like if we would have both done it, we would have rushed it to get done on time. And I don't want to rush these. I really don't because yeah. I feel like these should be in-depth yeah. investigations about what happened. Yeah. So if we run short, that's always going to be okay because I can find some like creepy woods stories or other miscellaneous mm -hmm. missing 411 stories from Reddit. We want to do it justice. Yes, though. and that's exactly it. We want to do it justice. And, and I realize that even more now researching this one because this one like hit me hard i uh i realized well, a little kid right what a 16 year old girl oh i realized yeah you sent me a different one yes that we were okay i realized that uh i get kind of obsessed with these i mean mm -hmm. this whole week and the week before i was pretty much butt deep in researching this i spent so much time on websites looking this up. I spent so much time listening to podcasts about her disappearance. I watched YouTube videos about her disappearance. Wow. I feel like I got pulled into this one really, really badly. And I think that's something that's going to happen to me with these missing 411 stories. So I think it's good to devote all of our energy to one okay. person per I'm topic. Down with that. I am too. And if, if we get a couple that are just like, yeah, this person just disappeared one day in the woods, we can do <laughs> we can do multi yeah. people. Yeah. But for now, I just want to stick with one to give them their due justice because like you said, these are important. Yeah. And this one hit me hard because this girl was only a couple years older than my students right. that I'm with. And 
when we uh, a couple weeks ago we were at the school forest and I was teaching a geocaching course and I was out in the woods with like a maximum of ten or eleven kids. And there were a couple times where I turn around and somebody's gone. Mm. So I'm yelling their name and it turns out they were just lagging behind. But I can... Your heart like, must just stop, We're going to get into this. Like the teacher uh, in this situation ended up having a nervous breakdown. Oh, sure. And, and refuses to talk about it. And yeah, because you know me, I would be devastated. Oh my gosh, yes. If something happened to a student and I was kind of Responsible tasked with for watching yeah. them. So this one, mm. this one really affected me badly so i wanted to do this one do justice because i really want somebody to find her one day and uh forewarning going into this it's gonna be very 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 minimal on the paranormal and it's more true crime i feel i really feel that this one is more true crime than paranormal is it kid friendly yes yeah it's kid friendly but i just feel like it's more somebody killed her then she disappeared mysteriously in the woods gotcha so This one is about 16-year-old Trini Gibson, and a majority of this comes from, there's a woman named Laura Rist, and she is kind of the one that is the go-to person for this investigation. She has a website at www.canadiangirl77.com, and girl is G-U-R-L. I'll put a link to her page or her blog in The Strangers because it's really good. She has pictures of the people involved, the places. She has pictures of the classmates that were there this day. So she is, she's interviewed like family members. She's interviewed people that were at the park that day. So she's like the go-to person for this. So what does she do? Um, is she like a journalist? Or? A chef. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. Well, she, say, is there a connection? There is a weird like psychic thing going on here so she says um and again i will put this i will put her blog it some of the stuff on her blog that hit me hard was were photos of what trenny had written to other people in their yearbooks like to see the girls yeah (sighs) just like the her personality and how i get teary talking about this stuff yeah i get teary talking about this stuff it sucks so this comes from a site called Investigations for the Missing, and this was written by Laura Rist, who okay. is kind of the go-to person for this case. She writes, quote, In June of 2003, I had just been connected to the dial-up internet. I remember those days. Oh, my God. <laughs> I remember the sound. I do, too. I can still hear it in my head. Uh, and when she got hooked up with this, she joined the Doe Network, which is a network for missing people and unidentified cold cases and all that. And she says, By the time I was several pages into it, I was getting ready to call it a day when a voice whispered to me one more. One more page loaded and I scrolled down the page and was met with a photo of a brown haired teenage girl with a cute smile. She intrigued me. Something about her eyes. They seemed to speak to me. They pleaded with me for help. In fact, I heard the words help me more than once. I clicked the icon to read her case synopsis, and that's when things really got weird. Her face met mine once more, and I felt as though I had been struck in the chest by a heavy object. My windpipe felt like it had been constricted. I had difficulty breathing, and I fell to the floor. Gradually, I got my breath back. I sat up, shut off the stove, and returned to my chair. I was breathing again, but the hair on both my arms and the back of my neck was standing on end. I looked again at this girl's photo and her case synopsis. My brain screamed, quote, she knew the person. The person or persons who inflicted harm on her. She knew them. She's not lost in the woods. She didn't run away. She no longer walks this earth. She's the original gone girl years before the phrase was coined. I knew then what it was I had to do. I shut off the computer and stood up. It all made sense. I began mentally preparing myself for the task that lie ahead. This young lady had found me. Now it was up to me to find her. A journey begins with the first step. Mentally, I grabbed her hand and we stepped forward. Wow. So does she claim to be psychic? No. Oh. And she's very skeptical of psychics. So this which, which, is specific to this yes, case. Okay. Yeah. But I get this. I get this, you know, and I think this happened a lot with Maura Murray, where people just feel this, like, connection, connection. once they first find out. And I feel, I kind of feel that way about, about Tranny, too. You know, and a lot of that is that she's a 16-year-old girl, and stuff like that is just so hard because it's... Imagine being hey, her you can't you can't imagine being her family. Oh, yeah. And just think of all, like, the lost potential right. that, that is, her like, a void in the her. world because this girl is no longer here. Right. You know, so who knows what she could have accomplished? Exactly, and that's what that's what makes this so hard. So here we go on to her case. On the chilly Friday morning of October eighth, nineteen seventy six, sixteen year old Trenny Gibson was dropped off at Bearden High School by her mom. I believe it was in Knoxville, Tennessee. 
Trini was a junior in 11th grade, and she was hoping to one day attend the University of Tennessee and to study landscape architecture. And it's just stuff like that amazes me. Like, I could never imagine being interested in something like that. Right. You know, and it's just, it's neat to see what people's passions are, Mm -hmm. because that's just like, oh my God, I can't even, I fall asleep just reading the words landscape architecture. (laughs) I mean, I'm enjoying my gardening stuff happening right now, but I can't imagine doing that for a living. No. So Trini was fascinated with flowers and plants. Her horticulture class, which consisted of 38 people, were taking a field trip that day, but her teacher, Mr. Wayne Dunlap, was keeping the location a secret and hadn't told anyone where they were going. Trini took her bag lunch with her and left her purse and her school books in her mom's car. She said goodbye to her mom, not knowing that it would be the last time that they would ever see each other. Mm-hmm. And and there's a lot that comes up with with people being upset that the students didn't know where they were going on a field trip. Oh, they didn't even know ahead of time where no. they were going, so and they that's, couldn't even tell their that, parents. That's like a point of contention because it's it's suggested. Uh, Laura says that she believes some of the students did know where they were going, but some of the students didn't know where they were going, mm-hmm. and that becomes kind of a factor in the disappearance. Is is whether or not people knew where they were going? Mm-hmm. Um, but people were like so mad about that but i feel like that's an example of presentism where you're looking at how things were in the 70s and things were i was around in the 70s and and, and things were pretty fast yeah things were pretty fast and loose with yeah with the rules you know i just saw a funny thing like a headline it was like a meme or something about how when we were kids you're like mom i'll be i'm going to so and so okay just be back before dark yeah and now they're like okay you need to text me when you get yeah. there i need to know it who wasn't you're like with that. Blah, blah, blah. it no. wasn't no and and we had the lawn <laughs> we darts didn't have anything that, to worry about <laughs> we had the lawn darts that were a toy that you people got impaled in their heads with because they were just that <laughs> that point on the end of this thing you throw up in the air and we drank out of garden hoses you know i didn't have a special car seat my parents just threw me in the back seat and and (laughs) wished for the best basically yeah (laughs) i I still remember the day we were taking a corner and i the door opened and i fell out onto the road (laughs) and i'm I'm watching i'm laying in the road and i'm seeing yeah no i can i can tell you exactly where it was in manitowoc and i'm laying on the road and i'm watching my dad's car just keep going away and then all of a sudden the brake lights come on and then he reverses and comes back you know we're lucky you're here right now and people are like amazed that we used to drink out of the garden hose which i know it's supposed to be loaded with like bacteria or something we drank out of the garden hose i probably drank out of the garden hose more than i drink out of the faucet at my house and i'm reasonably okay (laughs) no maybe that's why i I never call us normal but that's why i never feel good anymore (laughs) but uh, you know it it was just a different time so a lot of people are really mad at this guy for not telling his students where they were going it was a different and he wanted it to be a surprise i guess but it's it's not known whether or not it's accurate that they did not know where they were going. Right. So then Trini got onto the school bus with the rest of her class. I believe Trini is short for Teresa because I see her name sometimes listed as Teresa Gibson, mm. but everybody referred to her as Trini. So interesting. Yeah. I've never heard that nickname. So Trini got onto the school bus with the rest of her class, and the bus started heading out. Then Mr. Dunlap finally announced that they were headed to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. The class was super happy and excited about this. The Great Smoky Mountains National Park is 522,419 acres in size. That just blows my mind how huge that is. I can't even really wrap my head around that. In the year 2019, it had 12.5 million visitors, making the Great Smoky Mountain National Park the most visited national park in the United States. And that surprised me. I thought it would be Yosemite or something like that. And it's not. It's the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Trini sat towards the back of the bus with a friend named Robert Simpson. We're going to hear a lot about Robert Simpson. So she sat in the back of the bus with her friend named Robert Simpson. Robert was a close friend of Trini's brother, and Trini's brother asked Robert to take care of her that day because Trini had never really been away from her family for that long a period of time. How long were they supposed to be gone? Just all day. It was like an all day thing. Okay. So that kind of struck me as a weird phrase because she's been gone from her family but it might have gone every day. It might have gotten done later than usual. Maybe. The field trip, I don't know. But either way, Trenny's brother like tasks tasked Robert with with keeping an eye on her. Okay. The bus got to the park around noon, and it parked in the Klingman's Dome parking lot. Klingman's Dome is kind of is funky. Like I was looking at pictures of this thing. Um, maybe I'll post pictures of it in the in the group. But it is not what I expected. Is it an actual dome? It's really cool looking. So this is Klingman's Dome. Oh. Whoa. 
Yeah, I mean it's you actually drive or it is, walk no, up you there. walk. It's like a trail that you walk up this this twisty trail up to wow. this dome. That's really cool. So Klingman's Dome is the highest point in the park. And they were the bus was in the Klingman's Dome parking lot. As they got off the bus and gathered in the parking lot, Mr. Dunlap told them that they were to hike the almost two mile Forney Ridge Trail to Andrews Bald. And Andrews Bald is like a section where there's like not a lot of trees and it's just like shrubs, like a bald okay. person. A bald spot? Like a bald like my head. <laughs> that, that's so that's Andrews Bald. So they were supposed to hike the almost two mile Forney Ridge Trail to Andrews Bald, noticing the plants and flowers along the way, without taking any of them, of course, and then to make their way back to the bus. They were told not to take any side trails and not to go any farther than Andrews Bald and to be back at the bus at 3.30 p.m. The students. So wait, he was telling them they were going to go without him? He was going to go, but they oh. didn't have to stay together, you gotcha. know, because everybody goes at different speeds. Sure. So he's like, you guys, we're going to take this trail, go to Andrews Bald, and then get back to the Meet bus by 3.30. Yep. Okay. He's gotten so much grief about how this was run, but... Again, it's the 70s. Yeah, and it, it you know, like... And they're not There like was toddlers. one chaperone tasked with, with taking care of 38 mm. students, but... Yeah. You know, I I feel like he gets unjustly attacked for all this. Well, they're teenagers, though. It's not like they're oh, eight I year know, olds. I know, I know. So anyway, you got to blame somebody. I know, and and people, there's yeah. So he said, "Be back by three thirty." The students all said they understood, and then they all headed off. Mister Dunlap was the only adult chaperone with the thirty eight person group. The students all started hiking on the trail, splitting up into small groups here and there, like you can imagine. You know, and I could totally yeah. see that. You know, you're going to have your friends walking with your friends. You're going to have the slower people walking with the slower people. And I've seen pictures of this trail, and it is not what I picture. I pictured in my head like a nice, like, stone trail, and it's yeah. not. It's like a rugged, it's kind of a more rugged trail, and apparently a lot of the sides have steep drop-offs. Mm. But this is the trail that they were taking to Andrews Bald. Robert gave his jacket to Trenny, who was a little cold and hadn't really dressed well for the hike since she didn't know where they were going to go. So she was wearing his jacket. Eventually, the groups of students began to arrive on and off at Andrew's Bald, spending some time there and then turning around and heading back on the trail. Trenny and Robert arrived there together. The two of them decided to have lunch there, and Trenny shared her sandwich with him. It began to rain a little, so the two of them went underneath a tree until the rain stopped. So now we're getting to the point where things become kind of uncertain and sets off the chain of events that happened. It's believed that Trenny wanted to start the return hike back to the bus, but Robert said that he wanted to stay at Andrew's Bald a little bit longer, so Trenny headed back on the trail to the parking lot. As she walked the Forney Creek Trail back at a quick pace, she would catch up with various groups of students, talk with them for a bit, and then move on ahead of them because she was moving at kind of a faster speed. As she came upon yet another group of students, they said that they were going to sit down and rest for a bit because I guess one of the students had asthma and was starting to huff and puff. So they wanted to sit down for a bit, and they said that Trenny was welcome to join them. She said that she wanted to keep heading back. The group of students watched as Trenny headed farther down the trail. They said that they saw Trenny stop on the trail, crouch down, and look at something off the right side of the trail like she had seen something interesting. Then they watched as she stepped off the right side of the trail, and that was the last time that anyone ever saw Trenny. Once that group of students got back up and resumed their walk on the trail, one of them checked out the place where Trenny had walked off the trail, wondering what she saw. That student later said that there was really nothing there. That area was just super thick with shrubs and rocks with a stream behind them that made it slippery. There wasn't a side trail there or anything, and the terrain was so thick that it would have been hard to get through. The girl said that she called out Trenny's name a few times, wondering where she went, but there was no response. They just figured they didn't see her getting back on the trail and that they would see her back at the bus. Mm. At 3.30 p.m., Mr. Dunlap and the students quickly realized that Trenny was not there. A student asked Robert where Trenny was, since people saw Robert with her on the walk to Andrew's Bald, but Robert said that the two of them had split up after lunch at Andrew's Bald because she wanted to get back, and he ended up hanging out there a while longer because he was, quote, tracking a bear. Later, the students reported that none of them recalled seeing Robert on the walk back, either on the trail or hiking with anyone. And, you know, in a lot of the missing 411 stories, the search and rescue situation can seem like a cluster fudge, mm-hmm. like a mess. But this one was like really, they were on the ball with this. And, and that actually kind of impressed me. 
Mr. Dunlap made a call around 3.40 p.m. that they were missing a student, and one of the park rangers arrived by 4.30 to investigate. He went up and down the trail but couldn't find anything, so he made an official report that they had a missing student. By 6.30 p.m., 19 search and rescue people from Tennessee and North Carolina had arrived to begin the search. Wayne Dunlap also stayed behind to help while the students returned on the bus. And I feel just like so empathetic for him, Mm -hmm. like what he must have been going through because that sucks. Sheer panic. Sheer panic. Oh my gosh. Trenny's mother, Hope Gibson, was notified by telephone at 8 p.m. that evening that Trenny was missing. Trenny's parents arrived around midnight with clothing that Trenny had worn recently so that the search dogs could track her. The search for Trenny was called off for the night at 3 a.m. due to bad weather. And that's a missing that four, that's a missing four one one thing is that like bad weather always comes in when they are mm-hmm. searching for. So I thought that was interesting. The next day, a huge search took place, including search and rescue specialists, park rangers, National Guard helicopters, and several tracking dogs. A few broken bushes were found near where Trenny left the trail, and three cigarette butts and an unopened, partially full can of beer was also found sitting in the area. Many of the dogs tracked Trenny's scent to the base of the Klingman's Dome observation tower, and then they caught her scent again at a spot on the paved road near Collins Gap, about 1.6 miles away from the Klingman's Dome parking lot where the bus had been. More cigarette butts of the same brand were found at the shoulder of this road where the dogs led them to. Hmm. So according to Laura Rist's blog, quote, The search for Trenny continued until October 22, 1976, and then a limited search was carried out until November 2, 1976. A total of 756 people had searched for Trenny. At this point, the search was called off because no physical evidence could be found anywhere to indicate that Trenny was still in the park. Park personnel stayed alert for any evidence in the case as part of their regular duties. A second search, organized by Robert Gibson Sr., uh, her father, began on April 18, 1977, and lasted until May 5, 1977. Three days were lost due to bad weather. Eventually, all major and minor trails, drainages, and ridges between Andrews Bald and Elkmont in Tennessee, a distance of 15 miles, and Fontana Lake in North Carolina, a distance of 14 miles, were searched. 230 people participated in the second search. So, I mean, they they combed that oh, area. Yeah. They, they she were there. Yeah, they combed that area. From the strangeoutdoors.com website, it says, quote, In 1981, during an interview, Trenny's older brother, Robert Gibson, expressed appreciation for all that the FBI and the searchers had done, but he also spoke of his disappointment that the school district did not have policies in place to better protect the students. Based on his experience as both a Boy Scout and a Scoutmaster, he thought that one adult chaperone for 40 students was at least three chaperones too few. The Gibsons did everything they could to keep their family together after Trenny disappeared, including selling their home and moving to a new neighborhood to not have so many painful memories. But over time, the loss continued to take its toll, and in the wake of her disappearance, Trenny's parents divorced. Trenny's older brother, Robert Jr., died in 2000 at the age of 42, and Robert Sr., her father, died in 2004 at the age of 67. Tina... Trenny's sister died in 2016 at the age of 54. Wow. Yeah. They're all really young. Yeah. No trace of Trenny was ever found in the park. She would be 61 years old today if she were still alive. And her mom is still? Yes. Okay. Because uh, Laura Rist has been in contact with her mother. Okay. And uh, that's really strange that so many people from the same family died so died young. Died young. And it just, like, it kills me to think that they. Died not knowing what happened to her. Like, no idea of what happened to her whatsoever. So now we get into theories. Theory number one, she ran away. And that that comes up a lot. Um, But there's stuff that doesn't make sense about this. Like... Yeah, where's the backstory that lends to that theory? Why, you know, and I get that, like, the idea of the, the dogs finding her trail going to the road... Like, people theorize maybe she had somebody planned to pick her up, but she had not been in, I don't think she's been in this park ever before, so how would she know to get from where she was to that specific part of the road? she didn't know she was going to that park. Exactly, and that's another thing, is that she supposedly did not know where they were going that day, so she probably couldn't have prearranged this with somebody to pick her up. Did she have an unhappy home life? Did she have a boyfriend people didn't approve of? Like, where's the... Yeah. 
I don't, it doesn't make sense to me. No. According to an October 27th, 2017 article on strangeoutdoors.com called, quote, The Mysterious Disappearance of Trenny Lynn Gibson from Klingman's Dome in the Smokies, the article says, quote, A classmate and friend, Kim Pouncey, said in an interview in late November 2017 that she wondered if Trenny just didn't take off from the park and that maybe she wanted to leave or to get out. She said, quote, my feeling is somebody was waiting for her in the park. There was a parking lot very close. I've always felt like Trenny planned it, and that was her way out. So some people think, but but Trenny's what? <laughs> out, I, Trenny's purse, bank book, makeup, clothing, and cash that she had at home were all left behind and and in stayed un, untouched. Car, yeah, right? she she had more than a thousand dollars in her bank account, which was never touched. She left her money she had at home. And nobody knew where they were going, supposedly. That's a point of contention with this, mm-hmm. whether or not the students knew where they were going. You know, and if she truly didn't know where she was going, there were no cell phones back then. She couldn't just call somebody or text somebody and be like, hey, I'm at Smoky Mountains National right. Park. Yeah. Pick me up on this road. I-, I wish we knew more whether or not the students knew for a fact mm-hmm. where they were going on the field trip and if they didn't. You know, they believe that some students, like the teacher might have been closer with some students and said, you know, don't tell anybody, but this Mm, is where we're going. In interviews with some of Trenny's classmates, a few of them seem to remember that they did know the field trip's destination ahead of time while other people didn't. Hmm. And that, it sucks because this clouds the whole investigation about whether or not, did Trenny know where they were going? Did, Did Robert know where they were going? And there's things like... Robert is the brother, right? Robert's her brother's friend okay. that that was with her when they went to Andrew's What's her ball. Brother's name? Robert. Okay. <laughs> so it's a that's lot. why I'm. I'm confused. just going to refer to him as her brother. Okay. Thank you. But uh, like Robert, her friend that she she made it to Andrew's ball with and shared lunch with him. Yeah. Are people he, suspicious of him? Very. Okay. Did, did, we'll get to that. Did, we'll get to that. Okay. Did he know where they were going? Did Trenny know where they were was going? Was he a smoker? Did this other person that I'm going to mention in a little while know where they were going? Okay. So it would be so much better if we knew for a fact whether or not the students knew where they were going that day because that would maybe help crack the whole case. I feel like kids don't just run away out of the blue and it's a total shock to everyone. I feel like when kids run away... It's not yeah. surprising no, was, because you know something's going on. You know, on. she was a little rebellious where she, you know, her parents didn't know that she smoked. But if she was with oh. somebody that was smoking, she would like take a couple puffs off their cigarette. Okay. And, you know, it, it did not sound like that she had a... equate to running no, away. No, it sounds like she was close with her, her family. She was very, very close with her older brother. She had plans like, for going to college. Yeah, like this killed her older brother when oh, this I happened because imagine. they were super close. Especially and, when he specifically assigned someone to look out for her. And another reason why I do not believe she ran away is because Laura Rist has been threatened. You know, she has gotten anonymous emails saying, quote, stop looking into this unless you want the same thing to happen to you that happened to Trenny. Oh, so she's been threatened wow. investigating this. Okay. So I mean, that could be a sicko just playing with her, oh, but you never know. It could be a sicko playing with her. But no, there, there's more stuff that she is convinced that people know what happened. So I, I don't play. think she ran away. A lot no. of people do think that she just ran away, but I just feel like... I feel that makes you feel better, though. Yeah. Like, oh, she just left of her yeah. own accord and we don't have to worry about her. One thing that really puzzles me is you almost have to look at a map of the park, but it says that her scent was traced to the base of Klingman's Dome. So the parking, so the bottom the parking of that lot ramp? where the, the parking lot where that, I think the actual base of the dome. Like the, she walked up the ramp. The, no, like to the dome, not up the ramp, but the okay. base of the dome. But if you look at a map, the parking lot where the bus was is here. Andrew's Bald was a, a hike south. Okay. Klingman's Dome was north of the parking lot. She would have no reason to walk up to Klingman's Dome. Had they already been up there? I don't believe so. Oh. I believe they all just took that, that trail to Andrew's Bald. But and uh, this is Why getting would a, her this scent is have been up this there? is getting ahead of myself. But Laura has it on her blog a picture of like the base section of Klingman's Dome, and you can see in one of the pictures there's like an, a door. And apparently there was like a little room there that was just like a dirt floor that maybe they used to store stuff, but it was open. So people wonder if somebody didn't take her there temporarily. Mm -hmm. But it just like the whole, like the fact that her her scent went to Klingman's dome is like one thing that I can't piece together with everything else because it makes no sense. The only thing I can come up with is she was walking faster than everyone, got back to the parking lot and was like, oh, I'm just going to go check this out by myself real quick. It's, It's possible, but but... 
that the last point she was seen by anybody was, was when she off looked the off the trail and saw something. Yeah, people would have said if yeah. she was spotted back in the yeah. parking lot. Yeah. So that's So make I don't sense. I do not buy that she ran away. I no, really I don't. don't. Either. Theory number two, she became lost in the woods and died from exposure. And the thing was, she was unprepared for the hike. She had Robert's jacket on because she didn't bring one because they didn't know where they were going. Right. They could have been going to a museum for all, still all they knew. still lends to the idea that she didn't know where she was going. Yeah. She and didn't dress appropriately. She, she wasn't dressed appropriately. There were sharp drop-offs along the trail. And people are wondering if when she looked off the trail, maybe she had a pee. And she was like looking for a place where she could yeah. dip into the woods and something... Well, did they say there were some slippery rocks behind yeah. where she went? She yeah. could have fallen. And she could have fallen, but that they area had her. to be searched like crazy because that was the last place that they anybody saw her. Maybe she like fell and hit her head and was disoriented and wandered off it's, into People the... wonder that. People wonder, you know, one of the theories that I'll get to, I'm getting ahead of myself again, but people wonder if she didn't get lost or hit herself and become disoriented, walk out to that road. And again, it was like the perfect storm, like people say with Maura Murray, where some psychopath picked her Just up and killed her. Just happened to come by, yeah. You know. Took advantage of the situation. And that, that's, this one is like hard because there's so many good theories, but then there's almost stuff that shoots down all those theories that makes no sense. Nothing fits? No. So it's, you know, it does happen. A woman named Susan Clements went missing in 2018 in the same area. An October 5th, 2018 article in the Citizen Times called, quote, Great Smokies Hiker Found Dead This Week is 11th Death in the Park This Year. The article says, quote, while the official cause of death is still under investigation, park spokeswoman Juliana Campbell says fall play is not suspected. This highlights the many natural hazards that exist in the sprawling half million acre park in the North Carolina slash Tennessee mountains for experienced as well as inexperienced hikers. Clements, 53, a city of Cincinnati auditor, had been hiking with her 20 year old daughter near Clingman's Dome. They were returning from Andrews Bald on the 1.8 mile Forney Ridge Trail, which is where Trenny disappeared. It's considered a moderate trail with an elevation change of about 400 feet from the parking lot to where it descends to the Bald at a 5,860 feet elevation. When they were about a quarter mile from the Bald, the daughter went on ahead to climb the Klingman's Dome Tower with plans to meet her mom back in the parking lot. Campbell said Clements never appeared. She was last seen around 5 o'clock September 25th. Clements was considered an experienced on-trail hiker. The mother and daughter had spent a couple days hiking in the Smokies, including on trails longer and much more strenuous than the Forney Ridge Trail. The way they hiked together, the daughter wanted to do a few more miles, so they would often hike together for part of the trip and then meet back at the parking lot. That was fairly typical, Campbell said. The search for Clements lasted a week and involved 175 trained personnel from five states and 50 organizations, helicopters, drones, and canine units. It finally ended when her body was found the night of October 2nd in incredibly thick vegetation down the steep Huggins Creek drainage in Swain County, two miles west of Clingman's Dome parking lot and three quarters of a mile south of the Appalachian Trail. Campbell said people are asking how it's possible to get lost in such a busy place as Clingman's Dome, which is popular for its tower, the highest point in the park. It's reached on a paved path from the parking lot. It's also the jumping off point for many trails, including the Appalachian Trail. It would have been very easy, particularly given the conditions she was hiking in. It was very foggy, raining, and probably darker getting dark that someone could miss an intersection or the parking lot and get off on the wrong trail. So it, it's, it happens. I mean, people disappear there, take the wrong turn, and it happens all the time that people do get lost and die. And you never find their remains. No. And I could see that happening with her, but why was her trail then tracked to Klingman's Dome mm -hmm. and the road? The road. Like, that makes no sense. Unless, like I said, it was a perfect storm where she wound her way to the road and was picked up by a serial killer. The dome piece doesn't. That's no, the, what's the so dome odd. piece doesn't fit up. Doesn't doesn't fit with anything for me. And that's the one thing that really puzzles me about this case is why was she tracked to the dome? Mm -hmm. So I don't buy the just lost. I really Not don't. Really, I don't no. either. But her looking off the trail and then stepping off the trail, maybe she did need to go to the bathroom, or she saw something that she thought was like a flower, she thought was interesting, right. and and slipped, mm -hmm. you know. But I just I have a hard time buying that she's just lost. Yeah, I really I do, do too. because she should have been found. But yeah, they searched yeah. extensively for her. Theory number three: she was murdered by a random serial killer or random people. 
Reddit user Squidvet says, quote, Predators walk the Smoky Mountains, and I'm not just talking lions and tigers and bears. Never walk alone on the Appalachian Trail or anywhere on trails along the Appalachian Trail, especially if you're a woman. And that's a given, that there's going to be who Predators. knows who out yeah, there for sure. preying on people that are walking. On, like, the Appalachian Trail is, like, scary to me. Like, a lot of weird, bad stuff happens there. There's a time when I would have loved to have hiked the trail. Yeah. And now that I'm older and wiser, I'm <laughs> now like, after all these missing I'd have to bring ones. a lot of people with yeah, me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, just being a female, I would never do that alone. One theory says that somebody grabbed Trenny, took her to the Klingman's Dome observation tower, and held her there against her will while the area was being searched. The tower itself was not investigated at the time. Subsequently, when searchers left, they believed that she could possibly have been taken from Klingman's Dome to the roadside and left by car. But the only way up there is that long thing right no because she was at the base of it she didn't oh. go up she was at the base like and below. that's where the door was yes where, oh. it was below okay like she was taken underneath where the dome is Ugh. okay web sleuth username betty p said quote i also checked the trail that runs from Klingman's dome to cooper's gap you can find hiking videos of it on youtube that's way too steep and narrow for anyone to navigate at night i assume that's the theory if someone came to retrieve tranny or her remains the evening of her disappearance resulting in the dogs finding her scent at cooper's gap another possibility for dogs picking up her scent is that someone tossed an item of hers from a passing vehicle mm. and i guess that makes sense but Did they find an item no but i mean Where's I, could the see, item? <laughs> I don't know but i could see how that would set off the sure. dogs but like she said, uh, this wasn't, if you were coming back at night to go into the middle of the woods to grab a body, it's not flat. It's not like, right. it's not like a paved path in a park. Mm -hmm. There's streams, there's, there's valleys, it's there's treacherous. rocks. It's, yeah. tre it's treacherous. Like somebody wouldn't be able to do that. Unless they really knew the trails. Unless they really knew the trails or if they left her somewhere more and then than one came person. back and drove back into the parking lot mm -hmm. that night. But I'm assuming after she disappeared that there was a constant presence there searching for her. It would be hard to come back in, yeah. but they didn't have surveillance cameras at the time. So somebody could have came in that night after the searchers quit because of the bad weather and then grabbed her body, threw it in the car. But it also doesn't answer why she was tracked to the road. Right. Like she walked through the woods to the road. Well, and did they track her all the way to the road or did they just pick up her scent at the road? I believe they tracked her through the woods the, to the okay. road. I'm not 100% sure. And but, the fact that her scent disappears there tells yeah, you she had to. But also, Trenny was, we'll get into this in a little bit, but she was, um, she, why on earth would someone off the trail have beckoned to her to be like, come here? And then why would she have stepped off the trail and walked to that person if she well, didn't know that person? Why would she have person? down to look at I don't something, know. though? I don't know. But people theorize that maybe some random serial killer perv was there and they like, hey, come over here once. Why would she do that, though? Exactly. That just exactly. seems so foolish. Exactly. So maybe it was somebody she knew. So. Right. I don't know. I, I don't. I can understand the random person theory, but I don't 100% buy the random person theory. Right. I don't know. You know, I don't I don't get it. But now we're getting Somebody into... Somebody said we say I don't know a lot. I know. I'm realizing now that's true. <laughs> now we're getting into the nitty gritty stuff, though. Okay. Ooh, the nitty gritty. Theory number four, she was killed by Kelvin Bowman. Oh, that's specific. In October of 1975, one year before her disappearance, a schoolmate of Trenny's named Kelvin Bowman was seen prowling around the Gibson's yard. He was apparently friends with Trenny's older brother. Trenny's mom grabbed a gun, opened the door, and ended up shooting Bowman in the foot. He was arrested and spent six months in a correctional facility for juveniles. When he was sentenced, he made threats in the courtroom to harm Trenny when he was released, and when he got out, he swore that he would get even with Trenny and her family, and he even made threats about killing her. Why specific wait, why specifically Trenny? He because I don't know, he blamed her for everything that happened. He busted her window and was trying to climb in her he actually did climb into her window at one point and was like chasing her down the hall. So he was fixated on her. But the to thing begin is they with. were kind of friendly before this happened. Mm -hmm. And I guess he was drunk that night. He was really drunk and he he yelled something to Trini that I can't say on here yeah. because it would get us an explicit rating, but he yelled, Give me that okay. blank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it sounds like he was there that night drunk trying to get Trenny's brother to come with him, out with him or something like that. 
And when Trenny must have told her mom that he was there, Trenny's mom shot him. So I feel like he blamed Trenny for him getting shot. Okay. But he... Sounds like he had a fixation to begin with. Yeah, like he... That's not normal. No, it's believed that he had a crush on her. Crush? Yeah. But (laughs) he... But I feel like to go from that to actually killing someone is a is a big step. But he sounds but anyway, a little unstable, though. He swore that he would get even with Trini and her family and made threats about killing her. Some students that were on the field trip that day said they recalled seeing Bowman's vehicle following the school bus to the park that day. But school principal Frank Hall stated that Kelvin Bowman was in classes at Bearden School the day Trini disappeared. And Mr. Dunlap said that no cars were following them that mm-hmm. day. And this is another big point of contention. It's said by students there that if you show up for a homeroom at the beginning of the day, you can basically leave after because that is like, unless you're in a college credit course, they really kind of don't care if you're there or not. They don't do roll call or anything not like in, that? They do that at the beginning of the day in homeroom, but the rest of the day, they kind of don't. Huh. But I feel like if he wanted to get on the bus and f- or to, to follow the bus... He would have had to leave earlier than homeroom, but the principal swears that he was at school the day that Trini disappeared. And Mr. Dunlap said that no cars were following the bus that day, but I don't really understand how he would know that unless he was constantly watching for but it. But there are students that swear that they saw Kelvin Bowman following the school bus that day. Hmm. You know, and Kelvin Bowman was like immediately after or when people started saying, hmm, I wonder if it was this guy because he threatened her. Oh, yeah, I think I saw his car. You and know what I mean? It's yeah. like suggestibility. Yeah. But he, after this, like in 1980, I believe, he ran into some woman outside, like in, in the town he lived in and, and, and said that his water was shut off and he badly needed water. So she had him inside and he sexually assaulted her. Yeah. He sounds so, like a... yeah. Yeah. Like someone who's destined to hurt a woman at yes. some point. Yeah. So, but that is one of the theories is that she was killed by Kelvin Bowman, that he followed them out there and she was deathly afraid of him because of these threats. So people are saying if he was the one off the trail beckoning her, she would not in a million years have went out there if he was there. Unless he had an accomplice that she knew and trusted. Yes. And one of the biggies, number five, she was killed by Robert Simpson. I mean, that's where my mind goes. Robert Simpson Sr., his father was the district attorney in Knoxville at the time. So right after Trini's disappearance, he immediately coached his son on what to say, what not to say, how much to say. I mean, that's natural, I guess. Yeah. But he was, you know, a lot of people focus on this thing where he was, he didn't want to, he said he didn't come back with her from, from Andrew's ball because he was tracking tracking a a bear. bear. That's kind of weird. And people, a lot of people that think that he did it, believe that that was like a spur of the moment excuse. And now he's stuck with it because he can't really change his tune. Mm -hmm. But then people said, why didn't he just say I had to go to the bathroom and I was embarrassed to go in front of her. So she went ahead. Why would he say he to to this day? He claims he won't talk about this case. He refuses to talk about it with anybody. But he says he was tracking a bear, you know, tracking it. How standing there watching it one day following it. Apparently he was at home. And his grandmother said something like, where were you that day? And he yelled at her. He said, I was tracking a bear. And he left the room and walked out in a huff. That, And this one is hard because like, I feel bad for him if he really has nothing, nothing to, to do, do with, with this. Because he yeah. is like the number one suspect. Mm-hmm. Like he is the number one suspect in all this. He's not the last person to see her alive though. To no, and he's not. And if something happened with them at, at Andrew's Bald where he did something to her and she felt uncomfortable i would assume she would have said something on the way back when she was walking with her classmates maybe but this is a biggie so trenny's mom bought her and her sister some distinctive big puffy 1970s sort of expensive stanley brand combs and i think of i think of dazed and confused where the girls had like the big puffy combs in their (laughs) pockets all the time (laughs) yeah you know so she bought that for her and her sister and they treasured these things and always carried them with them after Trenny vanished, her brother was walking past Robert Simpson's car one day and he saw Trenny's comb laying on the dashboard of his car. Trenny's brother confronted Robert about the comb, but Robert said that Trenny had given it to him to hold shortly before she disappeared. Looking at the comb, it was obvious that Robert had been using it to comb his own hair. That's creepy. Yep. Trenny that day was also wearing a kind of expensive star sapphire pendant and a ring when she disappeared, which were Christmas and birthday presents from her family. This ring and pendant were found in the possession of a girl at Bearden High School in the sophomore class. She would not answer how she came to have them. Huh. 
So this comes from Laura Rist from her blog. She says, quote, yes, her ring and necklace were taken from her. Simpson claimed that Trini had taken her jewelry off in the bathroom and had given it to a classmate to, quote, hold for her. This classmate was not the same girl who was later found to have the jewelry. Trini was particular about her belongings, and she would not have given them to anyone, not even for a moment, like to try the jewelry on. And she loved that comb. Her sister had an identical one, their mother purchasing it them for purchasing their mother purchasing it for both of them as a special treat. So the fact that he had her comb that's suspicious. and this girl had and he's her, using it yeah, almost like and it's a trophy. trophy. And that's exactly some of the podcasts I listened to. That's what they called it is like a trophy. That's weird. So he had her comb. This random girl had her jewelry and would not say where she got it from. I don't think I have this in here. But finally, at one point, uh, somebody contacts this girl and is like, you need to give that jewelry back to the family. And she says she will. And she never did. The oh. girl died. Late. The girl's no longer alive. And she never said how she got people dying. I don't know. She said she never got this jewelry. So I, what I don't buy about like the explanation is that whoever that Trenny allegedly gave her jewelry to to hold would have come forward and said oh she gave it to me that yeah. this is true yeah so if it, nobody it, it came sounds forward like robert said that, he gave it to this other girl and this other girl did? ended up no robert said that okay. that Trenny gave, gave it, it to this to other girl, girl to hold and this other girl somehow gave it to this other girl i'm not buying any of that no and this is this is this is creepy like a plot that some of the podcasts i did listened robert to robert date this girl that i don't know ended up i don't with know the but some of the podcasts i listened to said this was creepy where all of a sudden like everybody else has some of her possessions it's creepy so um did this Laura, girl who had it know it was hers when, yes oh, that's... so laura riss says quote the relationship was strained between robert simpson and the gibson family after trenny vanished partly because questioning of Simpson came to a halt after his father stepped in and because he, Simpson, could not provide an adequate explanation as to where he was when Trenny disappeared. Add this to the strange comments he made, the fact that he had Trenny's prized comb, and this is another thing that, that I didn't talk about, but while, um, I don't even have this in here, while Trenny's family was at the park like the weeks after looking, he went into their house and was screening phone calls that the Trenny that that Trenny's family was getting for tips or possible leads. Did and they know about this? No. And when they found out that he was doing this, they were pissed that he was going into their He's like he involved. he was close with the brother, so he had access probably to the house. That's still but he make was going sense. into the house and screening phone calls that people were calling and tips and stuff. And yeah, it says uh, he was hanging around the Gibson residence, screening phone calls without permission. He had been tasked with looking out for Trenny on the trip by her brother, his good friend, and that was a job that you took seriously. Simpson knew he was a suspect, so he clammed up and distanced himself from the family because sometimes silence is freedom. Laura Riss says, quote, I believe that if he didn't harm her, he knows who did or what happened to her. He knows too much to not have been there. Too much evidence points to him. In the early part of the investigation, he was always right there with an explanation to any questions that arose. If he truly had absolutely nothing to do with her disappearance, then he's one of the unluckiest people on earth. Was Okay, so this other guy who was friends with the brother who ended up going to jail and threatening her, yeah. was he friends with Robert Smith? Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> Krista. So Krista <laughs> okay. I think we're going to get to that as one of our other theories. I'm getting to one of our other theories. And then Laura goes on to say, quote, He's tasked with keeping an eye on Trenny by his best friend, yet he lets her walk off alone so he can track a bear instead of walking back to the bus with a cute girl. He ends up with her or comb... Or making sure she doesn't get attacked by this exactly. alleged bear. Exactly. He ends up with her comb somehow. Fair enough, but he didn't hide it. It was on the dash of his car. He made no mention that he had it to anyone. It was discovered there by her brother. He claims Trenny asked him to, quote, hold it for her. Why wouldn't he tell her family this fact after she vanished? Trenny's ring turns up in the possession of another student. Simpson is right there with another ready explanation as to how they came to own it. The explanation doesn't make much sense, and really, why does he care so much about the ring and who had it? After all, he kept her comb. He came over to the Gibson's you know, okay, it is here. He came over to the Gibson residence in the days after Trenny disappeared and her family was in the Smokies searching for her. He was screening their phone calls and doing God knows what else until another family member found out and they put a stop to it. The Gibsons had not asked Robert Simpson to screen any of their phone calls or even to be at their house by himself. Trenny's grandmother had Simpson at the Gibson residence one day, and she questioned him as to his whereabouts when Trenny vanished. He shouted loudly, I was tracking a bear, and he took off out of the room like a shot. 
Simpson told Tina Gibson, quote, If Kelvin Bowman has Trini, he will kill her. If he doesn't have her, I think she probably ran off with some horny hitchhiker. That was that was his excuse. That's what he says he thinks happened that day. <laughs> okay. Simpson told Tina Gibson, Trini's sister, that if she hadn't run off with some horny hitchhiker, Kelvin Bowman must have taken her and killed her. Not a really nice thing to say about your best friend's missing sister, but then to implicate with certainty another student in the crime. These reasons only barely scratch the surface of why I think he knows far more than he is telling about what happened on October 8th, 1976. She goes on to say, in my opinion, yes, the case is solvable. The biggest issue is that the perpetrators think they have it made because they are confident that Trenny's remains will never be found. One of the suspects could never account for his whereabouts when Trenny left his company to hike back to the bus and he had an assistant DA in Knoxville for a father. Some classmates of hers hold on to the runaway theory, claiming that she had trouble at home but can't further explain it or crack under questioning. After she disappeared, her comb was found in a student's car and another student had some of her jewelry. Trenny was very particular about things, especially her belongings. If she wanted to give them away, she would have given them to her sister. There were a lot of threats in the air. The atmosphere was just heavy. I was told, quote, keep quiet or the same thing will happen to you that happened to Trenny. If Trenny just had enough and finally ran away, why would she leave all of her money, identification, clothing at home, and then walk nearly three hours in an unfamiliar territory? And what were the threats all about? I believe someone out there has one hell of a story to tell. Perhaps someday they will tell the right people. My goal until that day is to bring awareness to Trenny's story and ensure that she is not forgotten or lost to time. I also want to encourage folks that visit the site to stop and think. Things are not always as they seem. Do not believe everything that people tell you or don't accept it as the gospel. And just because something has been the acceptable truth for more than 40 years, it doesn't mean it's true. Mm -hmm. So she is, uh, Laura is very much on board that Robert either killed her or was involved in her killing or knows what happened. Theory number six It was more than just one of her classmates, or at least more than one was somehow involved or knows what happened. And this makes the most sense to me. Um, And it seems like they're covering for each other. It really does. According to Laura Rist, someone she's friends with went to a basketball game a few months after Trenny vanished. He saw this cute girl. He was up in the bleachers, and he saw a cute girl that he knew went to Trenny's school. So he went over and was kind of like hitting on her and trying to put the moves on her, and he was talking to her. This is Robert? This is just no, a classmate. This, this is Laura. Yeah, this is Laura's friend. That's just like he went to. He went to a school that was like a competing school, like with sports. Okay. You like know, like rival. they played each other. Yeah, like a rival school. Okay. But he was at a basketball game and saw this cute girl that he knew went to her school. So he went over and was trying to hit on her and talk to her and making small talk. And you know, eventually he said to her, "I wonder what happened to Trini." And he said that the classmate looked at him with a really weird look, and she said, "Quote." She was dead within half an hour of when she vanished, and then the girl gave him a strange smile and walked away. <laughs> he also got to know a group of girls from that school, and they got to like know each other and trust him. So one day, they told him that Trini had been taken by Jeep and buried at a location called the Mellinger Death Ridge, which is like seven miles away from Klingman's Dome. And they told him, do not tell anybody we told you that, because then we will end up dead. So yeah. Well, according obviously to, he told someone. <laughs> according to Rist, a week after Trenny disappeared, someone called the Knoxville Police Department and told them that Trenny had been raped and stabbed and that her body was buried where two streams crossed in the park. So wait, did anybody search this ridge that he said the girls no, told I, him I about? No, I believe not. It's a huge ridge, mm-hmm. and I believe nobody has really I searched take it. take cadaver dogs out there. I know. But at this point, I mean, uh, hey, yeah. Man, you never I, know. Yeah. It's worth a shot. But according to Rist, a week after Trenny disappeared, someone called the Knoxville Police Department and told them that Trenny had been raped and stabbed and that her body was buried where two specific streams crossed in the park. The problem was that the, they named the two creeks, but these two creeks never crossed. And um, her friend that that was involved in this case with her realized that there are two trails that have those names that do cross in the park but I don't believe that the area where those trails crossed was was searched. I feel like there's some missed opportunities here. Yeah. Even so, this, and, this, and, and this states, Well, at the time that, I mean, how much time had passed when this information came out? I'm guessing it wasn't just in the last couple of years. This must have come out oh, about, about, decades about ago. About those two streams? Yeah. 
it was like the week after she disappeared, but oh, Laura, no, Laura recently might have, they might have been the ones to finally realize that that might have been names Two of trails. paths instead of streams. Because mm. for a while, people probably wrote it off as a crank because those streams never crossed. And then Laura realized that they could have meant trails and that could be where she is. But now it's 40 years later. I think a park ranger would be like, oh, we have two trails. Yeah, you would think name. so. <laughs> Rist also states that some of Trenny's classmates for years after seemed to get very nervous when there was a natural disaster at the park, like something will be uncovered. Mm. And the fact that Trenny's jewelry showed up in the possession of another girl could lead to the fact that several people were involved in her death. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the most disturbing thoughts to me is that a group of students killed her. Right. They it, plotted to like, kill like her. Like you see in a horror movie where a group of students like accidentally, like I know what you did last summer, where, where a group of students accidentally kill somebody. And then they all have to work to cover it up. Yes. But it seems like a lot of people in this class know something and i i think that if, if if one of them killed her and told other people those other people are going to get nervous if her body is uncovered because then they're going to be questioned why if they knew about it and and all that stuff and finally theory number seven it's a truly paranormal missing 411 situation you know it was weird that there were people ahead of her and behind her on the trail along with god knows how many other hikers in the park when she disappeared mm -hmm. and you have stuff like like she saw something interesting off the trail. Apparently, you have the bad weather coming in. Yep. There is a lot of of like missing four hallmarks of the hallmarks yeah. of a missing four one one case. That moment of I looked and there she was, and then she stepped yeah. off and she was gone. That's so common. And also, this is really weird. I don't. I don't. I, this is on. This is from the Bigfoot History blog. This showed up on the Bigfoot History blog. All of a sudden, one day it showed up. And said, "Quote today in Bigfoot History." New evidence in the missing hikers, Trenny Gibson and Thelma Pauline Melton, comes to light when a suspicious package and letter are discovered at a ranger station lookout in the Great Smoky Mountains. The package, which consisted of a used burlap sack, contained several items. Upon inspection, it was determined that three of the items belonged to Trenny Gibson, missing since 1976. Several other items clearly belonged to Thelma Pauline Melton, missing since 1987. Authorities did not reveal the specifics of the items found. But the interesting thing was that the burlap sack seemed to be covered in coarse, fine, ape-like hair. Samples were sent to a leading forensic lab for further analysis. Some have postulated that the hair was similar to hairs found stuck to branches and trees. These hairs are widely considered authentic Bigfoot hair. Many think now that the missing hikers were abducted by a lonely Bigfoot who roams the Great Smoky region. <laughs> Krista, okay. I saw Krista throw her head back. Is any of that true? Is that there... has never shown up anywhere else, and we don't... Why would you run like a, a blog and then make something like that up? That was the only place where this showed up is that this, that apparently a Bigfoot dropped off this Bigfoot sack. Okay. I'm thinking it was probably a human, a serial killer who killed both of these people. But I, but I never see anything Bigfoot about hair. there's like no trace of this sack showing up anywhere else online other yeah, than this Bigfoot that blog. Made up. And that just annoys me. It's like, why muddy the waters of this thing with this clearly cockamamie story about a Bigfoot dropping off a burlap sack with their belongings. You're using tragedies to, you know... Yeah, I just... I it, Bring traffic to That just to your annoys site. me so much. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of the podcasts I listen to make fun of the missing 401 stuff and, mm -hmm. and say this wasn't a Bigfoot, this wasn't a UFO. It does have some hallmarks from the missing 411 cases, but I 100% like believe play. that this was a murder. Yeah, me and, too. Uh, and I, I don't think there's anything paranormal about it. No, I don't either. So, what do you think? <laughs> oh, this is this is a this is a this this one is like like I said, I get obsessed with these, and this has been circling in my head, and it I I cannot express how dark and and depressing and bad the thought is of some of these students luring her out into the woods and then raping her, killing her, burying her body. But this happens though. Yeah, but then also like how. What, what was she, how was she tracked to Klingman's dome to that room underneath Klingman's dome what happened was she taken there by gunpoint by knife point did um Kelvin go did he follow them was you know there's there is uh I don't have it in here but sh uh Laura said that on some crime forum that she goes on somebody wrote to her that said that they know they're in, not involved but they know the case and know what happened and and this person told her that Robert's position or Robert's mission in this was to 
to give whoever killed her enough time to get to where they needed in the park. And that was Kelvin. This person said that Robert mm-hmm. and Kelvin were in cahoots. This is where my mind goes. To, to, do, to do this. And that and that's all the person said. But I could see that. But the only, like she would not have gone off the trail if Kelvin was there. She might have gone off if, if Robert was there beckoning her. But how would Robert have got up that far when he, she left him at Andrew's Ball? He could have left right after her and was walking in the woods alongside you cannot, the trail. It's so thick with vegetation in there. He could have taken a side trail right. in the distance, but he would have had to know that park immaculately too. But people said that he did have a vehicle at home. So is it possible that... So say that Robert did manage to get up to that section of the trail. She saw him and went off the trail and all of a sudden Kelvin stepped out from behind a mm-hmm. tree. What happened? Did they kill her in the woods and then put her body somewhere temporarily? Did they? Did one of them take her by knife point or gunpoint to Klingman's dome, keep her in that room underneath Klingman's dome? Because it's right off a parking lot, right? Yeah. And then kill her. And then did they come back after the searchers left at 3 a.m. with Robert's car? But then why was her trail tracked to the road? Did did one of them go out in the woods and bring it back? And these cigarette butts and the, the, the half-open can of beer, it sounded like the half-open can of beer was fresh. So it was like mm. somebody sitting there waiting for her. And if somebody was sitting at that Getting spot some waiting for her, up. if they were waiting for her, how did they know that she was going to be there alone at that time? She She was with another group of students. What if those other group of students didn't stop? their opportunity would have passed. Yeah. And she'd still be alive. <laughs> and one of the most disturbing theories to me is that like almost all the students knew what happened. Like when they were lying about seeing her look off, you know, did they, did Robert do something to her at Robert's ball and the rest of these students lied about it and covered it for him? Why would they though? If they were afraid of Kelvin and Robert. Yeah. But, but I, I think we have two viable suspects. We, I think either we one do, of them but could I, have been I involved. feel like, I don't know. I feel like. I think it's more likely that they were both involved. I mean, it, it said that Robert had a crush on, on her and Kelvin had a crush on her, but it, it's a, it's a huge step from go to having a crush and to, to killing her. Yeah. But Kelvin openly threatened her life. But that doesn't necessarily mean, he's, but he obviously raped this girl later in life. So he broke a window and climbed into their house and was chasing her. Yeah. <laughs> saying. Yeah. But then, but how, what lured her off the trail? Yeah. The that's only why thing I, I can think, think of is Robert, Robert or another classmate. This girl with the jewelry, was she in on it? Was she was there she, that day? I, no, no. But, but I think we're not sure who she gave her jewelry supposedly to hold. So yeah. say that another girl was involved and as her trophy, she got to keep her jewelry. Right. And then she realized things were getting hot that people were investigating. So she gave this other girl the jewelry to hold. So maybe was it Kelvin or Robert and another, this other girl that got her ring? Did they kill her, take her comb, her rings? I don't buy for a second that she gave anyone her personal I don't belonging. either. I don't here, either. Here, equally irresponsible person, hold my possessions while we're out in the woods yeah. instead of me holding but them. I feel like it's a leap to go from Robert being her friend, her sharing her sandwich with him, him liking her to killing her and keeping her comb as a trophy, like a serial killer trophy. That's why this one Kids is just do so disturbing. Astounding I know, things. but this one, like, like I said, the darkest possibility for me is that most of the class was involved in this and knew she was going to get killed. And they're lying about where they were on the trail. They're lying about seeing her look. Maybe she didn't even hook up with them on the trail. Maybe she was killed long before that. But, right. But then why, what, why was her track? Why was her trail taken to Klingman's dome? And why was her trail taken to the, the road right you know how did, far from the how far from the dome is the road where they picked up her scent i'm not sure i, th- I think they said 1.6 or 1.6 miles or something and like was that. that the next day that they found that or was yes, it, it was the next, next day. day so the only thing it could the have o- happened like overnight. the only thing that makes sense is and i'm not saying they did it but say robert gets ahead of her on the trail lures her off the trail where kelvin and him and maybe another student either take her by knife point or gunpoint somehow to Klingman's dome, rape her there. That we even know maybe of. We don't bring, know that she maybe was assaulted. bring her right? back out to the woods, kill her, and then come back later that night. One of them goes into the woods to get her body, drags her body out to the road where her scent was. And then maybe they take her to this other mountain where they bury her. And I don't know. I mean, I don't... But you the, said that room wasn't even searched though, right? Until, no. No. So they, she could have been there the whole time until yeah. she was dragged out to the road. Yeah. 
the next day. Yeah. And people said that they couldn't, they, there's like no, they don't know where Robert was between the time that supposedly she left him and, and they met in the parking lot. People don't remember seeing him on the trail. But What time did he get back to the parking lot? I think around the same time as everybody else. See, that makes it hard to believe that he was dragging well, that's her what, off to a and dome. Of, and... And, and seriously, if you're interested in this case, the Missing Maura Murray podcast guys do a five-part series on this where they talk extensively with this the Laura Rist. And, and they talk okay. about the timeline and how little time they would have had to kill her and do something with her body. I want to say it was like 10 minutes or, ha- or something else. Or maybe, like I said, maybe she never was on this trail where they saw her. Right. Because they said, according to them, she was last seen around 3 o'clock. Mm-hmm. So she would have been close to being back. I guess it was like half a mile to the bus from there. So maybe these other students are all lying about seeing her on the trail and she never made it up to them. But why? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That's why none of this makes sense yeah. to me. There's I no mean, perfect explanation. At most... Everybody, and I hate saying this because I hate the thought of accusing somebody who didn't do it, but most people think that Robert had something to do with Simpson it. Simpson had something to yeah. do with this. And a lot of people pair him with this Kelvin. Right. But I just feel like it's a leap to go from what they did to flat out raping and murdering her. But people do Where's it. Where's the rape come in? Is it just because someone just said Just because that? somebody suggested no. that. But we why else, that what else, why, what other reason would he have to, would, you know, Robert have to kill her? Unless he did something and, or was it like an accidental where they were messing around with her and they accidentally killed her? And, Could be. You know, but. But then how do you get Calvin there? I don't know. When the principal <laughs> says. No cell phones, the principal says yeah, and the principal says that he was at school when other students said they saw him follow the bus. So are the students all like lying? Misdirecting. Misdirecting? Like I don't taking know. Taking the suspicion This one, is, this one was like maddening to me because <sighs> I desperately want this girl's body found. Most of her family is gone. Right. Her but for her, around, huh? I want her to rest. Hmm. You know, so part of me wishes I lived in this area because I would go out there with a shovel and, and just look. <laughs> right. Like I want, I want Trini found. Like this, this might become like my investigation case that I really, really feel for this case. And... And unless her body is discovered, I don't know. Yeah. You know, I, but um, Laura, like Laura is Murray. convinced that she's buried in that woods, in that area somewhere. Hmm. But then I don't, I just can't wrap my mind around the trails that the dogs, and it wasn't just like one dog. It was multiple dogs that went to these same exact spots. Hmm. So some, it wasn't just one dog. I mean, it was a lot. Hmm. So I don't know. I feel like, yeah, there's So what do you think? What what do you think? What's your... (laughs) I think there's foul play, 100%. I think there are two viable suspects, but neither... It doesn't make sense to me. No, neither one completely adds up because of eyewitnesses. And I I have a really hard time buying that a whole bunch of people were involved or are covering up because why? Why would they? But the jewelry thing is so suspicious to me. The comb thing is suspicious to me. Like... He knows something. Even if he yeah. didn't do it, Robert knows something. Yeah. This Calvin guy, maybe he did or didn't. Because it's like she would not have given her her comb to just hold for her. Why, why? would she have even I taken it in the first place? I don't know. But she always had it with her. She always carried. It. That was like, like her, in her back pocket. Like yeah, whatever. it was always in her back pocket. Like seventies girl. Sure. You know. But I don't know. why on earth would she have given it to him to hold? That makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah. So I think. Nothing makes perfect sense. I think if my opinion is that if he didn't kill her, Kelvin somehow did and and gave him the comb. I it, the only thing that makes sense to me is that the two of them were involved in it together. You t- that's what I think. And too. I hate thinking that because I hate the idea of him listening to this podcast uh-huh. and I'm accusing him of doing right. this when he didn't. Right. But but he won't I'm... talk about it. And it's like and Laura always says Robert, if you well, have nothing to do with this. Yeah talk about it to us right like she has tried to get in touch with the teacher and the teacher wants nothing to do with her but she talked to his ex-wife and his ex-wife said he had breakdowns over this and i I totally believe that yeah and she calls him out for not wanting to talk to her and that kind of annoys me because i know how i would be if something happened i would not want to talk about it that doesn't mean i'm guilty it just means that this this is so devastating to me i don't want to talk about it right yeah, but uh, yeah, one of the things that really, really annoyed me is that looking at like Reddit threads about it, somebody like some idiot Redditor just wrote one sentence that said the teacher clearly did it. Oh, come on. And that's what annoys me. Like the like the whole web sleuth thing. It's like mm-hmm. good and bad. Look what happened in the uh, I, I know, Lisa, Lisa Lamb, Lamb yeah. case. So my my the only thing that makes sense to me is that 
Robert and Kelvin were in cahoots somehow because she would not have gone off the trail for anybody else. And I, I don't think. think one person could have pulled this off. No. I don't. No. Considering like the timing of it all. And I think like the girl that had the jewelry, the other classmates that said, like the one girl that said she was dead within half an hour and gave the guy the weird smile and walked away, I think they know what happened. Right. I think a lot of those students know what happened. Right. Because at, at that age, you're going to tell yeah, someone. Yeah. But I think they were deathly afraid of consequences of right. telling somebody what they knew. So mm-hmm. that leads me to believe it was that, that Robert and... And Kelvin. maybe they felt like if they did, did tell someone, they'd be next. Yeah, exactly. They, and they said threatened. that. They basically said they told that we'll guy, don't tell anybody yeah. we told you this or we'll be dead. But then other you know, people to this day supposedly... I think supposedly, that's more likely than them being involved. Yeah, people to this day supposedly threaten Laura and say, mm-hmm. if you keep pursuing this, what's going to happen to Trini is going to happen to you. So, I mean, she's gone and it just sucks that there might never be a resolution to this. Right. And the only thing that makes sense to me is that those two... The only thing that makes sense to me is those two would have had to be in cahoots or mm-hmm. one of those two would have had to work with other people in order to do this. Yep. The whole tracking a bear thing makes like little to, or no, makes no sense to me. No. You know, it seems like an excuse. The first thing but you could what think happened of at, what happened at Andrew's bald? Right. Did he come onto her and she rejected him and he was so mad? You know, I don't could know. Could be. But that's what you think too, is that yeah. Robert was somehow involved yes. and, or Robert and or Kelvin. Yeah. Yeah. So I know this is this one is behavior. just like super depressing. This is one where yeah. I I would rather we'll probably was, never get close. I would rather it was some paranormal thing, to mm-hmm. be honest with you, than than this. This right. this poor girl. And like I said, this one uh, this one gets to me. So what do you guys think? What do you think happened to Trenny? I, I just have a feeling everybody's gonna be like Robert did it. <laughs> Robert <laughs> right. totally did it. Well. But his, you know we we have some listeners who are probably from that area. Oh yeah, I'd be really interested to see yeah. what the local news yeah. said. Or but I, I'm know. gonna keep I'm gonna keep following this one because this one is is really important to me now. So there you go. Okay. The sad case. Yeah, that of is really Trini. sad. Yep. It's hard when you get no closure. I can't imagine what her yep. family must have felt like. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Anyway, well, on to more cheerier, wah, wah. <laughs> cheerier things. Uh, I want to read a really sweet email we got the other day. It says, hi, Kurt and Krista, new stranger here. My name is Natalie, and I'm so happy I found your podcast. Side note, my brother's name is Corey, and their dog's name is Lucy, so it's kind of funny that all these (laughs) names get mentioned a lot. I have recently taken a break from social media, but if I still had one, I would follow you on every platform. You guys make me jealous whenever you talk about the strangers group on Facebook. My sister-in-law and fellow stranger, Tiana, introduced me to your podcast. Tiana had told me to listen to the David Glenn Lewis episode because I am from Yakima, Washington. I'm also very familiar with the story of Mel's Hole because I heard it for years on Coast to Close and it is close to Yakima. My passion for the paranormal and weird, I know, was shaped by the fact that Yakima has some very eerie places. For example, the Catholic middle school I used to go to was said to have been haunted by a nun who had committed suicide on the fourth floor by jumping out of a window. I've always considered myself a bit of an empath and in tune with energies. Totally get that. This school, with no doubt, was haunted. I experienced too many weird occurrences for it to not be. Yakima also has many parks, theaters, old and historic houses, and museums that are well-known haunted locations. It is also in the top 10 counties for spotting UFOs in Washington. I think we need to visit this place. Yeah. Overall, just a paranormally fused location. I can send you more stories about Yakima in another email. Yes, definitely. Fun fact for Krista, my father and grandfather were also very good friends with Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin and had known of the famous video as soon as they had gotten back to Yakima and showed them. I think that's so cool. Yeah. Bob still lives by my house and it is a fond memory for the family to look back on. If you guys ever want to play a drinking game on the show, take a drink whenever Kurt says, I really do. Or if you guys want to play a blackout (laughs) drinking game whenever either of you really says, or... If you guys want to play a blackout drinking game, drink whenever either of you says, I don't know, (laughs) (laughs) which I guess we say a lot. Thank you so much for taking the time to read my letter and for being genuine people. Stay strange. Question, where can I find your first episodes? I have Spotify and it starts out on episode five, my favorite mini mystery. P.S. Yes, Kurt, you say Oregon wrong. I know. Uh-huh. I am sorry. <laughs> Did she send some stories? Then? Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm going to save those for cool. a future story episode. So thank you so much, Natalie. Yeah. That was an awesome email. Yeah, hopefully we address the question about the episodes, but you can watch. I think you yes. responded to her, yes. but they are on YouTube. So if anyone's listening, if you're looking for those first episodes, they are available on YouTube yeah. and we're working on it. Yep. 
So yeah, <sighs> I, I'm just like I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted and I'm bummed about this. This mm-hmm. episode, like I said, really, like I, that's one of the reasons I feel like I can't listen to a lot of true crime mm-hmm. podcast or watch a lot of you get emotionally because it gets, involved. Yeah, like it gets it's emotionally draining and mm-hmm. it really gets to me. Like this one really got to me. Yeah, I used to listen to a lot of true crime and I just can't anymore. I, you know, like I said, I think of this poor sixteen year old girl's yeah. last minutes and it just like devastates Who me. Who knows how horrifying they were I they know. couldn't have so ended. it just sucks. Anyway. Song Song what was our theme this week? I totally <laughs> it was forgot. was a song you like better live. Yes, a song you like the live version of better than the recorded version. You want to go first? I mean, first? There's, there's often lots of live versions of songs. Yeah. Uh, well, first, my first answer was going to be virtually every fish song ever written. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're one of those bands that are better live. Yeah, than... I mean, their studio albums are great, but Fish is about the live experience. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Um, this is weird because this is a band I don't think I've ever talked about before, but it's Pearl Jam. And the song is Better Man. Better Man, like I'm not a Pearl Jam fan, but oh, Better I Man like is a good song. I like their older stuff a lot. Um, but if you just Google Better Man Live, it is such a great song to watch live. because We found this one specific concert. I don't know where it was. I can't remember it. I tried to find it. Um, but... Eddie Vedder, and I think this is probably common, he he starts singing and then he kind of steps away and the crowd sings the yeah. whole entire first yep. verse. Yep. And it just gives you the goosebumps. It's yeah. like, yes. it's just so cool to yeah. ha- have that many people singing in unison and yeah. it's really cool. Like that song that I love by Third Eye Blind called Motorcycle Drive-By. There's a video of them doing that in concert and the crowd is just like singing Everyone along. Everyone knows like, the words. Yes. Yeah. And like I said, that, that, one, that song is just like funny because that was never released as a single but if you're a fan of the band, that is like the song. So it's just the like, song. like some people hate, hate, hate when the crowd sings along. I love it. I do too. I do too. But some I've people been just, in that crowd some people just a, hate it. And I love it. It's such a cool it. feeling. Yes. You're like yep. one with, a, you know, several thousand yeah, like other people. I said, people. one of the times that I saw Blue October in concert uh, for like the encore, Justin, the singer came out with just his guitar and they have a song called 18th Floor Balcony. That's just like a really pretty slow song. And he started it and you could see that he was like legitimately choked up on stage because everybody was singing mm. so loud that he you couldn't hear him singing it. So cool. Yeah. There's a, a version of Queen's Love of My Life that the even, crowd sings. I don't even know that song. Oh, it's really pretty. But the crowd sings like almost the entire song and he, he finally comes in at some point, but it's like, it's really moving. I love that stuff. Huh. So that's I your, love the live stuff. <laughs> that, that's, your, that's your pick then, the Pearl Jam song? The Pearl Jam song, yeah. Okay, mine is by a female singer who is, surprise, surprise, one of my big is crushes. Is she cute? <laughs> I think she's really cute, but she's one of my big crushes. Okay. And uh, she has a very popular live CD called Mirrorball. Oh, Mirrorball. Mirrorball. I feel like I have this. Who is it? Sarah McLachlan. Oh, Sarah McLachlan. I've seen her, her in concert. Ver- her li- the, yeah. the mirror ball like, live version of the song, yes. Do What You Have to Do, Yeah. where it's just her and a piano. Mm-hmm. And like, well, I was watching this video again last night, and I'm just like blown away by how good she is. And at she the end of the song, she kind of has this part where she kind of ramps it up a little bit, and you just get goosebumps like how good... But it's just like a beautiful, slow song. And just seeing her do that live, knowing that that's live... It's just like breathtaking. Like mm-hmm. she's an amazing singer. She is. And and I've always loved Sarah McLachlan. Me too. I always have. Me too. So my song is Do What You Have to Do. I saw her at the Lilith Fair like many, many oh, years I, ago. I would love to go to the Lilith Fair. Yeah, it was cool. There's so many like little known female singers that I love. Like um Heather Nova. She had some songs on the Dawson's Creek soundtrack. Oh. Like her song London Rain. Like I love that song. But it is so Dawson's Creaky, you know. It's like that era of music. It's yep, like, I know exactly what you're talking. Paula Cole. Paula Cole. Isn't that yep. who did the theme song? Yep. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, but I just love Sarah McLachlan, so that is my Me song. Too. Do what you have to do by Sarah McLachlan. We'll post these in the group. We gotta do some at least one question. Oh, I totally forgot about the questions. I'll do a joke. Okay. See, this is why we need a a whiteboard with a reminder list. <laughs> okay, quick question. Um, did I do this one? <laughs> I just read a one that I'm going to read in the future. How can you tell when there's 1,000 pounds of pickles under it's your bed? Because you said you did that one last okay. time. Because uh, Carly in Australia said that she, with, the, with your accent, she couldn't understand the answer. You're closer to the ceiling? Yeah. So I, I told her what the answer was. And <laughs> she's like, oh. funny. 
Uh, okay, what do you do to prevent bumps? Oh, did I read this one too? I'm going to just skip to the next one. What's green and pecks on trees? What? Woody woodpickle. <laughs> we had a, a dead woodpecker in our front yard the other day. That, is, it was that very was horrible. Sad. Okay, we're going to do one question. I think we might have either had this question already or we've touched on it a okay. lot. The question is, hi, Kurt and Krista. Love the podcast. My question is, what is what is, or what is your definition of the perfect song? Oh. No, we haven't had this before. No, but we've talked about songs that we think are like perfect songs. <sighs> the perfect song. Hmm. You know, they're like asking what, has to what is our opinion of the perfect song or what do you think makes the perfect song? Hmm. I I have one that I talked about last time. I think time. they're I asking about, what, make, what are the components of yeah, the perfect song. Like I talked about, I think in the last episode or the one before about Party in the USA. Like I think that is like a <laughs> perfect song because it's like, a, I don't know. There's like a, I don't want to say timelessness, but there's like some kind of quality to it that, hmm. that transcends it being a normal song like I, like like i struggle with that one a little bit because it's miley cyrus we're talking about but but it's just one of those songs that you know you know what i mean like everybody knows it sure yeah maybe because it was done to death on the radio yeah. but um the com- i don't know, you know to I, me the components of a perfect song if that's what what they're asking it's just it has to like move me in some way I, if I have an emotional response to it, and I don't even mean like it makes me sad, but if I have yeah. like an emotional yeah. response to a song, that to me is the perfect song. See, my idea of that is that it's like timeless. Like, yeah, that's like true. When, like I think about, and I've talked about this on here, that I think I think there's a handful of songs that have been perfect songs, not just because I like them, but because they transcend time and mm-hmm. they stay popular. That when you hear this song 20, 30 years down the road, you know, you don't turn it off. You're like, oh, this reminds me of like, you know, like when I think about like Walking on Sunshine or something by Duran Duran, they're <laughs> yeah. good songs, but they right. they are they're not that, timeless. No, they're that era that it's still a good song. Right. But I think about... I think about like Simon and Garfunkel. I think about Don't Stop Believing by Journey. Sure. Like that's one song that kids today know just as much as we knew it back when it yep. came out. And that's not a song that... Um, I feel like when you hear it, you can't exactly peg the time it came out because sure. there is like a timelessness to it yeah and i hear you there and i two other songs that i think about that with that i feel are like timeless songs uh the first one is africa by toto mm-hmm. that's like one of those songs that i think i know people that just loathe that song i like love absolutely it. hate it i love it but i think that the fact that that's like in our collective consciousness now like you know that song yeah. as soon as the beat starts you know that song and there's so many videos on YouTube of people doing that in different styles. Like everybody mm-hmm. knows that song. And I feel like, yeah, it's from like the late seventies, early eighties or whatever, but you can't place it. It just has like like a timelessness to mm-hmm. it. And the other one, it's funny that I got this question because I actually watched a video about what makes this one of the best songs of all time. I st- it was like in my YouTube suggested videos. And I don't know why, because I like the band, but I'm not crazy about them. But the video was about the song, and I still I think this is one of those songs that is a perfect timeless song. Is Mr. Brightside by The Killers, because that is one of those songs that I don't even know what that you song know that is. you know that song. Trust me, I don't me. know names of songs. I'll play it for you okay. after, but you'd be like, yeah. But that's one of those songs that everybody it was came on like two thousand four or something like that, and it's still to this day when you hear it, it does not feel that old. And it's just one of those songs you instantly identify and you're like, oh, I love this song. And that that's Mr. Brightside by The Killers. That's kind of how I feel about the Beastie Boys. Anything Paul's Boutique and later, that it was so ahead of its time that you could Paul's release Boutique that album super today. Ahead of its time. Yeah. You could release it today and it would sound Like I hated Paul's so Boutique current. when it came out because I wanted it to be licensed to Ill Part 2 and it wasn't. So I mm-hmm. like wanted nothing to do with it. And now looking back. I'm so back, glad it wasn't like, licensed it, yeah. to Ill Part 2. <laughs> I know. But yeah, like some album. songs that I consider perfect songs are... Africa by Toto, uh, Don't Stop Believing by Journey, Mr. Brightside by The Killers. Uh, I, I do think Party in the USA by Miley Cyrus. Maybe it's just because I love the song. I don't know. But I think there's a couple other songs like that that are just like perfect timeless songs. And mm-hmm. to me, it's timelessness. Yeah. So yeah, I really good question. Mm-hmm. So anything else? Deets? 
Deets. <laughs> Jump into the deets. You can email us at the strange sessions at gmail.com. We are on Twitter at strange session without the final S. Krista does a really, really good job on Instagram at the strange sessions. You can send us postcards and snail mail to our newly renewed P.O. box at the strange <laughs> sessions, P.O. box 434, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, 54221-0434. Or you can call our lonely little phone line at 920-443-9602. And I think that's it. We're just about to hit two hours okay. here. Okay. And like I said, this one was a, uh, hopefully it made sense to people. Like, oh, I feel totally. Like, okay. This yeah. one was just like a hard topic for me. Like mm-hmm. I took this one really, really hard. So I hope, I hope something is found one day. I'll be interested to hear theories. Like it, 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 like it freaks me out. I was thinking about this on the drive here to think like a national park like that or a big park like in Wisconsin how many people might be buried there that you know Ooh. nothing about? Because right. people like, I was just like reading, like stumbled across one of these where somebody's dog came running up to them with a skull that they dug <laughs> up a skull in the woods. Oh my gosh. And it's, it, it bothers me to think of all these people that might be out there and you don't know about them. Yeah. You Their know? families have no closure. Yeah. They didn't get laid to rest properly. Yeah. Okay, sorry to get, sorry to get this so t- depressing again. Go on on a low note. I know, went on on a low <laughs> note. But uh, thank you guys so much for, as always, for listening yep. and for the coffee stuff you yeah. guys have given us. And we do love coffee, so you know, if you're Krista metaphorically and I were testing, buying texting coffee, each other yesterday. Like, should we just quit our jobs? I mean, should we just do this full time? And we got a donation while we were recording. Yeah. So, so amazing. you guys are awesome. I mean, we absolutely love you. Yeah, and I, I think you guys know that we do. We wouldn't. I mean, maybe we'd still be sitting here doing this without you guys, but I doubt it. I mean, we might have given this up a while ago. Probably. If so nobody guys, were listening, you guys keep this going. So thank you so yeah. much. So from Krista and I in the now hopefully ant-free <laughs> strange cellar. Until next time, stay, stay strange. strange.